I wanted to go briefly on some of the salient points uh, of the book. And Palestine is something colonial. And the title of the book, as well as the work, is to reframe uh, how Palestine is uh, looked upon and how Palestine is approached. The discussions so far has been uh, one focusing on whether it's the Oslo Agreement uh, of 1993, uh, discussing the two-state solution, uh, the status of Jerusalem, uh, siege on Gaza, all of it is really thinking of problems that are in existence, but not looking at what is uh, at play in relations to Palestine. More importantly, is to situate the uh, Palestine uh, issue within the broader literature of colonialism. Because if we continue to uh, deal with facts on the ground in relation to what Israel wants, is they build a fact, they create a new uh, impediment, and now the debate and the discussion becomes focusing on that impediment or that new settlement or that new outpost and end up losing the sense of the totality uh, of what has been underway for almost 100 years. So this year is the 100 year anniversary of the Belfort Declaration. Uh, it also the uh, 70 year anniversary of the beginning of the Palestine crisis with Resolution 181 in the United Nations uh, that essentially divided the country to begin with in 1947 that subsequently led to the 1947-48 war. It also, this is the anniversary of the 1968-67 war which witnessed the uh, total takeover of the rest of historical Palestine, what we call today the West Bank, Gaza, and also the area that is the Golan Heights, uh, which Israel has already annexed. Now the book title itself is directly taken from a letter that was written by Theodore Herzl. Uh, founder of modern Zionism, to Great Britain's Minister of Colonies, uh, Cecil Rhodes. Now, if you don't know Cecil Rhodes as a Minister of Colony, he had a country named on his behalf called Rhodesia. And uh, once the colonial uh, structure was brought to an end in uh, Rhodesia, it became called Zimbabwe. So Zimbabwe was actually for a for a long period of time, uh, was called for the name of the British Minister of Colony, or Great Britain's Minister of Colony, Cecil Rod, uh, who was responsible for much of the ravages of Southern Africa. So if you take Southern Africa, whether it's Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Angola, South Africa, uh, and even you go into parts of Nigeria, you'll find that Cecil Rod's uh, footprints uh, in southern Africa, and the destruction that he visited upon those regions uh, is very well documented. So, when Herzl is writing to Cecil Rhodes, he's writing to a person that knows and understands uh, what, it, what he means when he says that he's seeking a colonial project. So, when he referred to uh, the letter, he said, you are being invited to help make history. It doesn't involve Africa, but a piece of Asia Minor. Not Englishmen, but Jews. How do then I happen to turn to you, since this is an out-of-the-way matter for you? How indeed? Because it is something colonial. So, Cecil Rod's le the letter that was sent to Cecil Rod framed the Zionist project from its inception, and this is 1902, as a colonial project uh, to be unleashed in Palestine, at the time referred to as Asia Minor. Now important, Palestine becomes the last colonial project to be commissioned in the 
turn of the 20th century. By the time you get to the First World War, colonialism was no longer in vogue. Colonialism was coming at the tail end, that all the territories that the world have claimed is there. The First World War actually declared the principle of self-determination, that no major power could claim that they are engaged in a colonial project. So Palestine debugs the trend that the, the moment that colonial projects are coming to an end and that the world has shifted, that the British and the Zionist movement introduce the uh, Palestine as the new and the uh, uh, authorized project to be unleashed in Palestine. So that's an important one that, again, is the last colonial is the last colonial project to be commissioned in the 20th century at a time where uh, the world has shifted and changed. The second aspect of this is that we understand from its inception that Zionism thought, uh, sought the protection of a major power. Right. So in here they sought uh, the protection of Great Britain. They actually had discussion with other powers. So they visited actually the Ottoman. They had a conversation uh, with uh, uh, Theodore Herzl visited Istanbul, having conversation and intermediary with Sultan Abdul Hamid, and asked the uh, Ottoman to grant a uh, territory in Palestine for the Jews uh, to establish a state, meaning Zionist Jews at the time. And Sultan Abdul Hamid refused, uh, saying that the land of Palestine belongs to the Ummah, does not belong to him individually. The Zionist movement also approached the uh, Russian, Tsarist Russia, to try to see if Tsarist Russia would sponsor and incubate the Zionist project in Palestine. And again, Tsarist Russia was exploring, but at the end, they didn't uh, embrace the project. So the British ended up embracing the Zionist project for their own interest. And this is, gets me into the second import, or the third important point of why did the British support the Zionist project? Right? Why did they issue the Balfour Declaration right? of November 2nd, 1914, uh, uh, and then really coming into its full fruition in November 2nd, 1917? Right, so why did the British issue the Balfour Declaration? We have, right now, uh, access to the minutes uh, from the British archives of what were the discussions among the British uh, ministerial uh, team that was looking for this. Uh, let me go into what the British were looking at. One, the British compared their colonial possession in Egypt, because Egypt was a colony to the British, and India as another colony of the British. In India, they had a natural protection for India from the north. You have traveled in India, right? Northern India is protected by a huge mountain range, and therefore the Russians can't invade from the north without really getting considerable losses. And that's why Afghanistan becomes the area or territory where the British and the Russians fight it out, what's called the Great Game. Right? So the British were looking, in India they have a natural border in the north, mountain terrain, and then in the south it's surrounded by water, and the British had a strong navy, uh, one of the strongest navies uh, until their demise of the Second World War. In thinking about Egypt, which is the uh, artery for the trade, for European trade, because they, you have the Suez Canal, that was most of the trade coming to Europe would pass through the Suez Canal, and Egypt does not have a natural northern boundary, meaning barrier. It's not protected. As soon as you get to the coast of Alexandria, uh, there's no mountains. Uh, it's basically like you're in Kansas, you just go stroll down, it's flat. Right? And you don't have any natural defense for Egypt, and therefore the British felt that they needed some security structure. Long and behold, what is the security structure? Is create a buffer state. So they thought by creating a state, a Zionist state in Palestine, 
they would create a buffer state, a state that could be militarized, that could assist them in preventing a northern invasion from the Ottomans, on the one hand, or possibly the Russians, right? or any naval uh, power that might attempt to invade Egypt, which is the artery for trade. Again, is the central uh, artery for trade from Asia, from many parts of the British colonial enterprise. They have to pass through the Red Sea, and into the Suez Canal, and into the Mediterranean, and so on. And the British already controlled the entry to the Red Sea, which is Bab el Mandeb, around Yemen. And they had the Suez Canal, so now they're looking at protecting their assets. So they were looking at it purely from a strategic consideration. Now the second thing, which should be a kicker for you. All those who were discussing the Balfour Declaration were anti-Semite. Balfour himself was an avid anti-Semite. The British at the time, in the late uh, late 19th century, early part of 20th century, there was a Jewish migration from Eastern Europe into Western Europe. As pogroms and violence against Jews in Eastern Europe was intensified, there was migration into London, Paris, some of the major Berlin, some of the major uh, Western capitals. So much so that you have a rising anti-Semitism in Europe, including in London, where these newly arriving Jewish immigrants were subject to anti-Semitic discourse. And the discussion becomes of addressing or solving the Jewish question. <coughs> right? Solving the Jewish question. Now let me take this part. Anyone that puts forth a question related to a religion, a religion or a race, they're racist because human groups are not a question to be solved. Right? Similar today, we have the Muslim question in Europe. The question is not in the Muslim, the question is actually European inability to live with the other. Right? So you don't go around answering your own question to justify your humanness. So I'm very critical of somebody saying, I'm human like you. Saying that statement implies that you're subhuman and trying to humanize yourself to somebody that is dehumanizing you. Because you don't see anybody going around saying I'm human. Like, I could see you're human. You're drinking, go to the bathroom, you walk on two feet, unless you have evolved just last week. Right? So in saying that argument and that basis <coughs> of posing the Jewish question, basically Europe is saying we need to solve the problem of not wanting to live with the Jewish persons. Now this has been normative in European history. And that's why I argue that the Holocaust actually is not the exception, but rather the norm. Because if you take it from 1492, with the expulsion and inquisition directed at Jews and Muslims, with all the pogroms that took place in Eastern Europe and continued violence against Jews in Europe, and then culminating with the mechanized and uh, process of killing and destruction, you would see that it's actually a long history of uh, many Holocausts taking place in European history. Right? So again, those who were thinking about transferring the Jews out of Europe, they were doing it out of deep anti-Semitic sentiments. In essence, we need a buffer state, and at the same time, we could get rid of the Jews that are in our mix in terms of London, Paris, and other places, so now we could send them abroad. Out of place, you know, out of sight, out of way, and in this sense, they will always be, be dependent on us. So we strike two birds with one stone in this sense. So that was the foundation of the establishment or the support for the issuing of the Belfort Declaration. Now, how the British get to control Palestine? I have a chapter on how they dismantled the Ottomans. And there was a whole strategic process uh, that dismantled the Ottoman state, uh, including creating what is called as the Great Arab Revolt. Right, have, have anybody heard of the Great Arab Revolt? Right. Uh, have you heard of somebody called Lawrence of Arabia? Right. Lawrence of Arabia. Now, I think I don't use the term Lawrence of Arabia. 
Because to be called and to have an attribute to the Arabs, belonging to the Arabs, is a high status and a praiseworthy, what you call attribute. I call him T.E. Lawrence of 10 Downing Street. T.E. Lawrence of 10 Downing Street. T.E. Lawrence was an intelligence officer stationed in Cairo. And he actually came up with the idea that the way to disrupt the Ottomans, especially in the Arab provinces, is to try to foment a revolt among the Arabs against the Ottomans. And they focus on Sharif Hussein of Mecca. Now, why would they focus on Sharif Hussein of Mecca? It's a good question. In the meantime, while you think of the answer, right? I'm going to drink some water. Now, why would they think about Sharif Hussein of Mecca? Right? What? Influential? Because the Kaaba? Anyone else? Why would they want to recruit Sharif Hussein of Mecca? No. Kaaba, Mecca, okay. Let's go through. His name is Sharif Mecca, meaning he's a descendant of the Prophet. Now, this is another information. We're in the 100th year anniversary of World War I, right? Now, the British Army, in some of its divisions, between 80 to 90% of the grunt troops that were fighting were from the colonies, meaning the darkies. And in the British Army, there were a large number of Muslim troops from India, from the subcontinent. They were hesitant in fighting against the Khalifa, who is the ruler of the Muslim world. How can somebody carry the gun and invade Muslim land fighting against the uh, uh, ruler of the Muslim world? What they needed is a spiritual cover. They needed somebody that has the credentials that when you tell the Indian troops and other Muslim troops recruited from Africa that you're fighting for a good cause, you're fighting in order to bring Khilafah to its rightful owners. And we have a correspondent, now we have all the right writings, all the letters are there. We have the writing between McMahon and Sharif Hussein of what they're promising him, and they promise that they will declare him a Khalifa. Right? Meaning the British were Ahl al Hal al Right? The British were the ones to determine. You don't need any people who are scholars doing fatwas. The people in 10 Downing Street will make a decision who's going to be the Khalifa. And the Khalifa for you would be Sharif Hussein. And we have the letter, they promise it. So actually, we should go to Great Britain, which is no longer great. Right? We should go and ask them that we want for you to declare our new Khalifa. Not the one in Baghdad, but someone else. Because right? you promised to do, to do this, right? So they wanted a spiritual cover. And Sharif Hussein, declaring the uh, revolt, managed to assuage the opposition among the troops in engaging uh, in a uh, fighting against Ottoman troops. Because you have Muslims on both sides. Right? These Muslims were fighting for the British army. Right? And the other side are troops that were fighting for the Ottoman army. And, and as such, they needed this revolt. So Sharif Hussein uh, declared the Great Arab Revolt. It was not great, nor was it Arab. It was made and manufactured in 10 Downing Street. In the same way, the liberation of Iraq, just in 2003, was not something that was made in Iraq. It was made and cooked both in London and Washington, D.C. So in the same way, this was to dismantle the Ottomans. So now look at the British and their strategy of during that time. <coughs> the British made four conflicting promises simultaneously. So we said now, they issued the Balfour Declaration, right? Say to the Zionists, we're going to have Palestine for you. Then they wrote to Sharif Hussein with the McMahon's letter, we're going to call you a Khalifa for all of these Arab territories that are going to be uh, uh, liberated after the end of the war. So now Sharif Hussein is promised, right? But you have a third 
Something that now we call, those who don't know, the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Now, what is the Sykes-Picot Agreement? This is the Foreign Minister of France and the Foreign Minister of Britain meeting together, eating croissant and drinking espresso, and divvying up the territories between them in secret, and also keeping the Russians out of it, even though the, the Russians were fighting with them. Talk about what you call triple double cross, not only double crossing, right? So the Zion is being promised, Sharif Hussein is being promised, then the French and the British are eating their croissants and signing, giving up the territories between them. Who takes Syria, who takes Lebanon, who creates Palestine, Transjordan, who gets Iraq, all this being decided in secret in sykes picot agreement. And then after the end of the First World War, the British also participated in the post-war conferences that also said we're gonna have, give people self-determination. Now, if there is a possibility to speak from four sides of your mouth, that was the British. Okay? Four contradictory uh, projects or four contradictory statements of policy. What ended happening, again, is that they adopted the Zionist project because it coalesced with their strategic interests in the region. So that's important in thinking about dismantling of the Ottomans and creating Palestine. So you cannot have a Palestine being colonized without actually dismantling dismantlement of the Ottomans. So they are related. In this in this process now the fourth element that have to come is the religious rationalization for the creation of the state of Israel or supporting Zionism now every colonial project rationalized itself through religion do you think in here when uh, the settlers came and killed the Native Americans what did they say you know the concept of manifest destiny Right? And when uh, the British, the French, the Portuguese, the Dutch, the uh, Spanish, uh, uh, Italians uh, colonized Africa, they colonized it with religious fervor, meaning using religion as a cover. So again, Zionism uses religious rationalization and have a religious discourse to support uh, the Zionist project. And in this sense, also some of the Western countries rationalize supporting Zionism based on religion because the taproot for much of Western thought in relation to who they see themselves is connected also to the conceptualization of the Holy Land. Right? So in here there is a collapsing of religious rationalization in the West in its support to, it, to Zionism and Zionism self-rationalization of a manifest destiny for its own self. That's normative, right? the structure of religious rationalization for colonial project is normative is not an exception we often begin to think and this is what you call in terms of muslims they go from zero to 80 in emotional response and they don't think rationally how to respond to these notions so as soon as you begin to speak palestine they go from zero to 80 and if you're an arab you go to zero to 120 emotionally you stop thinking okay? so again Normative colonial practices is to use and, and instrumentalize religion. So often Muslims, as a way to discuss and deal with Palestine, they begin to actually also deploy religious texts exclusively from understanding colonial structures. All right? So again, you cannot argue text versus text in relation to religious uh, discourse because essentially you're falling into right, the terms of the debate. Whoever says the terms of the debates actually wins the debate. So arguing on religious terms is not the way to actually identify it. You just actually to extricate yourself and focus on colonialism. And what does colonialism mean? It means a rationalization, not only for the people they're colonizing, but their own for themselves. Because you need your own troops to believe that they're doing it for God. And you can't, you know, you can't have an iPhone and call God and ask him whether you rationalize colonialism or not. And therefore, you cannot, you can never actually ascertain whether God have permitted this. Did God allow 20 million Native, 20 million Native Americans to be eliminated? Who's going to tell? Right? And then you get that, well, at least those who converted to Christianity, at least they're, you know, they're saved in the hereafter. 
Oh, thanks you a lot. Okay? You have to kill me in order to save me. MashaAllah. Okay? So that's a normative colonial structure. Now, the fifth item, colonialism has two different branches. Colonialism has two different branches. Regular colonialism and settler colonialism. These are two separate animals. Colonialism is what the British and the French, the Spanish, the Dutch were excellent at. You have a colonial motherland, right? You have a colonial motherland that sends its troops, sends its troops and companies to take over territories far away from its uh, headquarter or its uh, land, extricate natural resources, take natural resources, disrupt the economy, disrupt the political structure, reshapes education, right, and uses the same territory to dump its products back. So if you look at much of the southern hemisphere, now we look at the southern hemisphere, it's in the post-colonial stage. Post-colonial stage, the troops are out, but the companies, the political system, the education system is still colonial. Right? So often you get, like, why the Africans can't get along. Right? That's usually, or the Africans are killing one another. But that's post-coloniality, that the same structure of colonialism has been there, left intact. You only remove the direct troops from the control. The economy is still connected. So all, if you look at all the territories that were controlled by the French, in direct colonialism, is still connected in the hip, economically, politically, socially, to the French. Those territories and lands that have been conquered by the British are still connected economically, politically, socially, in the hip to the British, and so forth. So that's colonialism. Settler colonialism is a different type altogether. Settlers come to the land, they adopt it and take it as their own, rationalization takes place, and they don't have use for the indigenous population. Regular colonialism, they put the population to work. Go and dig the tunnels, go and dig the mines, uh, go and climb the tree to get the cocoa and the uh, mangoes, right? It's all labor intensive, disrupting the local economy and making the economy is almost cash crop and service economy to the colonial motherland. Settler colonialism does not have a need for the population. And usually, either they commit genocide against the indigenous population or transfer. Either they commit genocide, what happened in the Americas, right, is the most successful settler colonial project. Because all of us in here, what Native American tribe used to live in this area? Do you know? Do you see any of them? Do you speak any of their language? Do you know what, what they used to cook? Do you know any of their habits? Do you have any of their monuments? Do you have any of their structure? Nothing. We think that this area was just made for Silicon Valley, and those who work with Silicon Valley can live just at a distance from it, and that's how we know it. Right? So settler colonialism engages in genocide. In here, in Australia, New Zealand, okay? why? Again, because it has no use, it claims that land and wants to create a new trajectory. South Africa had a combination of limited genocide by transfer, what they call the five homelands, where you push the black Africans from the best lands, you congregate them into these five homelands, and now you say five homelands that are independent, it's a transfer project. Palestine is a settler colonial project. Okay, that's important. Palestine is a settler colonial project. For Zionism to succeed, it needed to transfer the Palestinians. And therefore, if you look at all the Zionist strategy from the early part of the 20th, 20th century all the way up to just yesterday, it's structured to transfer the population out, either through mass transfer during the 1947-48 Nakba, by utilizing violence, by utilizing massacres, 
um, by utilizing all types of tools in order to force the Palestinians to flee. Okay? That's normative. Settler colonialism using violence to cause flight and transfer uh, is something that we see in different uh, uh, circumstances. What we're right now facing is what's called the slow ethnic cleansing process. You make people life a living hell. You build walls. You limit their access to water. You limit their access even to food. You limit their movement from one place to the other by putting almost 500 plus checkpoints. You use frequent violence on them. You create different type of legal system, what's called apartheid. All this is incentivized to try to cause the Palestinians to leave or push them out. That's a transfer strategy that exists, and the debate about it existed in Zionism from the inception. That's why some of the modern Zionists who speak uh, try to say that it's incidental. There is nothing incidental in the transfer project that has been put in place from 1947 until today. So that's a direct outcome of settler colonialism. If we don't understand that, that's a major what you call error because we begin to be caught in trying to say who's taking which street rather than thinking of the need. The street itself is part of the mechanism of the dispossession of the indigenous population. So that's what's important in terms of understanding differentiation between colonialism and settler colonialism. So in the book, I go into details about how the Palestinians were expelled and the mechanism and so on by which uh, this occurred. So my last conclusion of the book, actually, I did not offer any solution because immediately any time you talk about Palestine, they, the question is like, what's your solution? I said there is different conceptualization of how Palestine issues to be addressed. And I'll just go over them very quickly, and then we could have some questions for people who want to ask. One, again, there is the uh, both sides, Palestinians say, fight it all the way until Judgment Day, and then on the Zionist side, fight it out until Judgment Day. So that's one, what you call almost uh, reflective of each other. There is the two-state solution, right? And that, by all indication, is almost dead, if not already buried, right? We no longer have a viable two-state solution on the ground. Right? If you look at the settlements, the bypass roads, the uh, natural preserve, the security structure, all that have prevented a two-state solution uh, from emerging. There is the fourth uh, possibility uh, in there, which increasingly people are speaking about, a one-state sol one solution, where equal vote for everyone that is there. That's the one that people increasingly are speaking about. And fifth, again, is that uh, possibility of Palestine being joined to a regional reshift, reshuffling of the region and collapsing of borders. And that's, an, again, people who think of greater Syria from the pre sykes picot agreement and whether that's a possibility or not. Each one of these have its obstacles, have its problems and challenges. Uh, and today, again, with the current White House, uh, I wouldn't hold my breath that anything meaningful uh, other than continuation of more destruction uh, for, for uh, the Israeli government and what the current right-wing Israeli government has been emboldened uh, by uh, the election of Trump. So the, these, if you think about the Middle East and the Palestine issue, what might transpired, uh, I think we are in a very precarious position at this point, uh, considering the configuration of individuals uh, that are sitting around the White House and advising Trump, assuming that he's taken their advice, which seems that in some areas he is, uh, but it doesn't bode well. Uh, just this week, Israeli government have announced in another cycle of uh, settlement building in the West Bank. Uh, so again, this is part of the settler colonial structure, and their main uh, protector is the United States, uh, which requires for us to rethink our engagement and our involvement in this country relative uh, to Palestine. So Jazakumullah for listening. I'll be more than happy to take any of your questions. So 
Assalamu alaikum. Thank you. So, how do you explain the position of Arab countries and the fact that they have been very passive? How can we explain the fact that they don't show their strong support to Palestine? Yeah. Well, remember I said that we're in post colonial states. Right? So, post colonial states, these states in essence are still subject to the political, political, economic, social constraints of their ex colonial powers. The world revolves around what uh, the US says, uh, what the European Union says, uh, uh, possibly also what Russia and China, even though that China entry into the uh, global political landscape is just of recent uh, occurrence. So that explains why most, if you look at most of the states, are uh, dependent on economic links to the global north. Uh, mostly are oil producers or also uh, one commodity producer uh, linked to their ex-colony. Uh, their decision making is highly susceptible to uh, considerable pressure because they are mostly in debt aside from the Gulf. And de indebtedness is a systematic tool to subvert the independence uh, of the decision making capacity of those uh, countries. So it would be much more appropriate to evaluate many countries in the Southern Hemisphere from a post-colonial lens rather than from a sovereign state lens. Because we get to uh, assume that they have the complete uh, total uh, ability to utilize their decision-making capacities uh, in order to influence uh, uh, greater political dynamics. And in relation to Palestine, most, if not all, of the Arab countries have accepted the permanency of Israel as early as 1947-48. And all what they've been engaging in is in a political, what you call, showmanship for domestic con consumption rather than for support for the Palestinians, again, because most of them are post-colonial states. Uh, and you could name it one by one and you could identify those dynamics. And then, more importantly, in the post Oslo landscape, most of the Arab and Muslim countries have uh, normalized their relationship even to a higher level with Israel, and their security have been connected directly to uh, their security with uh, Israel uh, at this point. Uh, lastly, in the heartland of the Arab world, there's been a massive shift to identify Iran as the primary threat rather than Israel. So even in terms of conceptualization of what uh, strategic security in the region, they no longer speak of Israel as a threat, they speak it as of having common interests. And in, you know, uh, we have already a number of meetings that took place between Saudi Arabia, national security uh, apparatus and Israelis in Washington DC as well as in Jordan and other places. So we are really post-colonial states that have not yet evolved to extricate themselves from uh, colonial legacy in this totality. Any questions? Uh, you were talking about Iran and uh, the situation uh, with Saudis and uh, you know, the situations in Washington. Uh, you know, with the recent uh, happening in Iran and uh, in, in that context, is, do you see uh, some kind of uh, dynamic shift with, with Iran, you know, getting um, a little bit, I would say, independent uh, in their approach. Mm -hmm. And how do you see if that's going to make a difference in the level of the clash between Iran and Saudis and it's, it's getting a kind of little bit out of hand? So, mm -hmm. is that going to make any, any better or worse? From 1979 till now, uh, if you think about the region, there has been a war between uh, Iraq and Iran. Then you had the Afghan war. Then you have the first Gulf War. Uh, then the second Gulf War. Now you have the war in Syria, war in Yemen. There's a conflict in Bahrain, in Tunisia, uh, Libya, uh, Sudan in the conflict in Sudan in the south, Somalia. And then you could also add the conflict uh, on Afghanistan that continues, uh, instability in Pakistan. Uh, but what's important is that the Muslim world have actually shifted into a sectarian conflict. 
So now the flavor of the conflict has been Sunni versus Shia. And that conflict being shaped that way begins to create, in my view, a mental retardation for people's analysis of what is taking place. So you could get people bent out of shape about Sunnism and Shiism, uh, while not stepping back and thinking of what are the reasons that these conflicts are being intensified. And in order to do that, let me step back. During the slave trade, in West and Sub-Saharan Africa, as the need for slaves to the New World increased, regional conflicts were increased. So the basis of trade was guns for slaves. So you bring guns in to both or all of the participants, they fight the war, they take slaves as captives from each other, bring them to the coast, sell them to the slave traders, buy guns, come back to fight another war, kill each other, get new slaves, take them to the coast. So it was guns for slaves trade. And that lasted almost 300 years. Today I argue that we have guns for oil. Okay? Guns for oil. The largest purchasers of Weapons in the world today are in the Arab and Muslim world. We're talking about contracts in the $80 billion, $70 billion, right? And how you sustain that by selling oil. So you sell oil, buy guns to protect against your neighbor. Right? And your neighbor sells oil, buy guns to protect against you. You tell this? He is the biggest threat against you. He tell her he's the biggest threat against you, and you strategize. He's Shia, he's Sunni. He prays with a stone on there, and that stone is basically his haram. And you begin to argue whether it's saddle or qabr, and people are talking and selling oil, killing each other, buying guns. Selling oil, killing each other, buying guns. And then you bring companies to build what you destroy right, for another 30 year contract. And so what we have, we need to understand that the conflicts in the region are centered on oil and natural gas. And that's, that's the reason. It's not about what type of uh, sect you are, but it's much easier to mobilize people on a dumbing down effect. Right? And to begin to think that there is a Sunni conspiracy, there's a Shia conspiracy. We begin to sit down. The only conspiracy is just people sleeping in the mosque. That's the only conspiracy. Because right? they're not awake to what is taking place. It took almost 20 years of work to get into a Sunni Shia confrontation. And as it looks right now, people will be killing each other for the next 40, 50, 100 years until oil runs out. And then all of a sudden, they say, oh, mashallah, let's embrace. We can't afford killing each other. But by that time, it's already gone. You're talking about three generations right now, at least at minimum, completely wiped out. And the best and the brightest from the Muslim world are all abroad. You're here, I'm here, everybody's here. Why here? Because you are not allowed to think. Right? He was arrested with a thought in his mind and fajr. Bring him to jail. And you're not allowed to take positions of importance. Why? Because you're not born to, as a prince. Because, it, you know, or a son of a prime minister has to be a prime minister. Even if he's the dumbest of dumb, he's going to be assistant to a minister. And all of a sudden, he's up there because that's it. That's a post-colonial structure we're dealing with. And that's essentially where we are at. Can we figure it out? You know, inshallah, let's do that. So again, it's an oil, natural gas for guns. And that's where the conflict is and sustaining this battle between people. And thousands, hundreds of thousands are dying for uh, really pennies uh, for economic purposes. And I know, you know, there's so many, so much preoccupation with the end of time scenarios. That for me is another problem because you have a whole bunch of people that just so good at what you call banging the drums of the end of time. Okay? Those who are waiting Jesus to come. Okay? Those, who, those who don't want Jesus to come. Everybody is banging the drum as if God will be happy for the end of time to come. It's none of our business. 
Prophet said, if the end of time comes and you're planting a seed, plant a seed. That's it. The rest of God will take care of that business. It's not you. And so again, for us to really rethink how we analyze what is occurring and not get bent out of shape. It is so good. Are you able to explain to us the unconditional support of the United States to Israel? Unconditional. Unconditional from all the presidents. Perhaps Obama was perhaps the best in terms of common sense towards Israel. How, what is the interest and what's going on that we don't know? Uh, again, one has to look at the U.S. political landscape. Uh, there is a statement that says we have the best, con the best uh, Congress that money can buy. So it's susceptible to influence, and the role of APAC is very important. You know, uh, the American Israeli Public Affairs Committee, it, it plays an important role in affecting and influencing uh, politics in this country and how commitment to Israel is undertaken. But below this, just like the British thought of creating a, a Zionist state as a strategic outpost, the United States think of Israel as a strategic outpost and can use it in the regional fragmentation to create what you call a, uh, a regional hegemon that could discipline and maintain the order in the, in the region from a United States perspective. Uh, is it sustainable for, for the long term? I don't think so. Uh, and require for us to change the argument about uh, Israel as a strategic ally and argue that Israel, on a number of points, is not a strategic ally, it's a strategic liability. Okay? One, uh, Israel has been a main conduit to funneling a missile technology to China. That is contrary to U.S. strategic interest. Second, uh, Israel has been a major player in the uh, nuclear proliferation uh, to other countries. They supported or facilitated South Africa nuclear program in the 70s. And then they were very instrumental in the Indian nuclear program. So if the United States is committed to non-proliferation, the NPT treaty, Israel has been a strategic liability by allowing and pushing for nuclear uh, armament, especially in India and South Africa. And also once argues that Israel nuclear program have incentivized Iran to pursue a nuclear program, uh, incentivized Libya to pursue a nuclear program, and also uh, one can argue secondary that North Korea nuclear program is a logical outcome, thinking that the country that did not have nuclear weapons was attacked by the United States. So in this sense, Israel is a strategic liability <coughs> from the uh, NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Third, if you think about uh, U.S. using Israel as a strategic asset militarily. During the first Gulf War and the second Gulf War, the United States asked Israel not to intervene and not to participate in the military uh, conflict because it would fracture the Arab alliance. So what is the value of a strategic asset? At the moment that you are actually engaged in military combat, it's actually is the, large, it's the biggest liability that you have. So that's a strategic liability in terms of Israel. Fourth, on the economic front, the relationship between the United States and Israel causes loss of market share for the U.S. in different countries, at least on the individual and communal level, because they see that relationship undermines uh, their ability to express themselves. So there is a strategic liability on the economic front. Uh, that there is loss of real uh, contracts from the United States in different countries uh, as a result of this. So that's also a strategic liability uh, in this sense. And fifth, the standing of the United States around the world often gets to be impacted by its relationship with Israel. So in that sense, Israel is, a not, is not good for business in general, and therefore the United States is dragged into uh, public discourse where it not, does not need to be, and therefore Israel is also a strategic liability from that. Uh, how to change it requires for us hard work. So I know what APAC does. Right? They, they do hard work, they're engaged, their political uh, process is uh, very strong. The Muslim community and the, the pro-Palestine community have not yet engaged politically in the same level to impact and begin to shift their political landscape. It's doable. Uh, but it requires hard work. Thank you very much for being here today. May Allah reward you. I was wondering your opinion 
Um, is a two-state solution for Israel and Palestine still possible? And if not, what factors and catalysts need to exist in order to make it possible? Well, I, I said that the two-state solution is, all, is almost dead if it's not already buried. Uh, with the building of settlements, bypass roads, <coughs> the uh, natural reserves, the emptying of Area C, uh, if you know the uh, framework of the Oslo. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be any political will in this country as a main supporter of Israel to alter that course. Uh, so literally the more, more of the serious people right now are talking about the one state solution, one person, one vote, similar to South Africa. Uh, so the two-state solution, essentially, as far as the structure, is no longer tenable with what Israel uh, uh, infrastructure that has been placed over the West Bank. In historical Palestine, is about 50% now, in all of Palestine. In Israel itself, which is the 1948 area, Palestinian population is about 28%. But if you add to it some of the uh, unaccounted for or those absentee, present absentee, it might add another 5 to 6 percent. Uh, the estimate is by uh, 2026, Palestinian population in 48 will be equal to the Jewish population in 48, which also creates a crisis for Zionism of what to do with a state that you don't have a Jewish majority. Uh, in, and that's something that, again, it's a racist discourse to actually contemplate political discourse while using demographics in there. But that's what, in dressings to 48, that's what you're looking at. So with the, no, the two-state solution not being a possibility anytime soon or even at all, do you see the Palestinians in the near future, living as second class citizens in an entirely Jewish Israel or an entirely Jewish Israel with Palestinian diaspora moving to like Egypt and other countries? Well, the, again, the, the discussion right now is Israel either it wants to be a democratic state or an apartheid state. That's the discussion. Even in Israeli press, if you read Haaretz, uh, if you read some of the Israeli press, that's actually the discussion. Are we moving to an apartheid state or a democratic state? So even the discussion about recognizing Israel as a Jewish state, that has the implication that 28% of the population are no longer really legitimate citizens. Right? So the discussion, again, is Israel wants to be an apartheid state or wants to be a democratic state. Even Palestinians who are citizens in Israel are subject to 50 different laws that discriminate against them. So even Without going, there are about 50 different states, 50 different laws that discriminate on Palestinians in 48, not those under occupation, so those are different categories. So in terms of post-colonization, how does Turkey as a nation that wasn't initially self-colonized fit into this uh, modern? Well, this, uh, uh, Turkey is a very, you know, uh, interesting, uh, uh, state, in the sense that Ataturk opted to embrace a almost the epistemic of colonial structure, right? By embracing, saying that the way for us to move is that we have to completely delink ourselves from the historical tradition that was part of the Ottoman legacy and Islamic legacy. So essentially, the project of uh, colonization that works systematically to transform societies to imitate the colonial motherland, Ataturk opted to shift the society in that direction willingly uh, as a way to try to embrace the Western discourse. So from 1926 onward, uh, changing the alphabet, uh, changing the mode of dress, completely reforming and uh, creating a new constitution, a new code, all that took place as a way to try to emerge into a new modernity that is a westernized modernity replicating the nation-state structure that you observed in you. So that's been the case all the way up to, again, uh, in Epsom Falls until the early 1990s. And what you have is a 
complete or beginning of a shift in Turkey uh, to see how to reintroduce uh, a link back to some of the historical tradition that existed in particular the role of Islam in public life. The Turkish state prior to the 1990s was hostile toward Islam so it did not have neutrality toward religion. To be a secular in Turkey mean, meant to be anti-Muslim or anti-Islamic and anti the role of Islam in public life. What post-90s argument is that is that the state should be neutral and therefore it should not express hostility toward Islam in public life. Right? And therefore the hijab becomes an important feature of this debate within the, within the contemporary modern Turkish state. Right? So in essence, while it is not a colonial state, it did not go through direct colonization, it actually experienced the residues and the structural impact of colonization because the dismantlement of the Ottoman was privy on the whole structure of colonization eating at the limbs of the Ottomans, culminating in the collapse of the state after first after the World War One, so now the Turkish project is still a project in the making of what is the role of Islam in public life, how to incorporate a a, a presence of both Islamic identity but also impact on the political landscape in essence how to bring Islam into the political landscape in there. So the Ak Party has been doing this uh, over the past few elections. Uh, but it's still it's a work in progress to see. At the same time, you still have considerable antagonism of Europe toward the Turkish state, uh, in essence, and their admission into the European Union is highly contested. Uh, I think part of it is Orientalist discourse, part of it is Islamophobic discourse uh, that we're witnessing in part of the European Union relations or treatment of Turkey in this sense. Uh, well, um, I know the, the discussion that's been around uh, the Zionists in Palestine and what's the solution, but do you see any sign that they're actually expanding beyond outside Palestine in settlements in one form or another? Like outside of Palestine? Yes. Well, uh, I don't think that the Zionists uh, and Israel uh, are expanding outside of historical Palestine. They attempted to expand in Lebanon, and we know the uh, consequences of that. They occupied Lebanon for a long period of time until they actually had to leave voluntarily as a result of the uh, resistance and the pressure in there. What Israel has is economic interest and economic relations uh, with the surrounding countries. So now we could say that Israel has economic relations and economic assets in Jordan, it has economic interest and asset in Indonesia, it has economic interest and asset in United Arab Emirates, in Qatar, uh, there is economic interest in Mauritania, in Morocco, right? So and this, again, the economic uh, uh, interests that are there and the assets some might deal with uh, land or companies and so on. I tend to look at it in a different way, that as Palestinians, I see that they, they have opportunities to file legal cases in all those countries to make a claim against those economic interests that Israel has placed. And what it requires is for us to change some of the strategies, and I'm hoping that at a certain point we will use the legal process internationally to bring cases against companies that are operating in Jordan and other places just like how they make claims against some of our companies or some of our assets in this country that we should be skilled in doing and doing so. So as such, while they think this as part of their normalization, I think is it as a part of Palestinians making claims against the benefits from the Nakba, the benefits from ethnic cleansing that have existed from 1947 up to the present. And I think in due time, this would be one of the major challenges of how to bring it into legal contestation in the different parts of the Muslim world. Assalamu alaikum. So, uh, so my question is more like, I mean, thank you so much for the very insightful you know, discussion and what you have mentioned about um, the, the other powers kind of weakening the, the, the Muslims. I mean, that basically points to weakness within ourselves, right? 
So I guess, and that has been the question, I guess, for the last 30, 40, whatever many years, that how do we improve that situation? Um, my generation is older, right? It's the next generation also. And the, the whole thing is like, uh, which unfortunately I don't see it, like, you know, the next generation, we are not imparting them enough uh, confidence in their own culture, in their own uh, identity, so that they can, you know, stand up and be strong within themselves rather than relying on, you know, other other powers. Like you gave an example of the Sharif of Makkah. I mean, we all know how that, that got decided, you know, the ruling family. They were the men who never, never had the, the, the caliber, but brought it from England, right, to rule an entire Muslim, I mean, not rule, but at least, you know, have their opinion in, uh, that the entire Muslim world is best. So, I mean, that, that's what the question is, like, you know, like, we have to identify what are the steps that can be taken and preferably for the next generations, educating them. History is a very good example, discussion, like, I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, what would be your suggestion? Well, uh, let me give a more uh, complex answer to this uh, that touches on a number of things. One, I don't think that the problem is uniquely uh, uh, a Muslim problem. If you look at Latin America, uh, you will find that the same dynamics uh, also are affecting Latin America. Not only that, if you just think about U.S. policy in Latin America, uh, most of Latin America, everybody knows, is predominantly Catholic. Right? So from a religious perspective, the United States is fighting other Christians. Right? And at a certain level, they were also confronting what called liberation theologians in Latin America who are trying to engage and to say that religion should be an avenue for liberating oneself. Okay. If you look at Africa, it's also the problem is not a Muslimness, it's actually again, it's same dynamics and if you trace the history, whether it's in uh, Angola, the war in Angola, uh, the war in Nigeria between the north and south is interesting. Whenever you have an oil pipeline, there's a war between two people in there. Right? Every time you see a conflict, don't look at the ethnic makeup, just look at the source makeup. Ask the question, what is there? Is it diamond? Is it gold? Is it gas? Is it cocoa leaf? Is it what? That will tell you more about the conflict rather than trying to follow to see whether they're Hanafi or Shafi or 12, 12 Shias or any, any of this sort. So the issue is not Muslimness or anything of this sort. Now, I said we're dealing with post-colonial states. Unless you begin to understand what colonialism and post-colonialism mean, you cannot begin to undo the effects. Okay? Colonialism disrupted the economy, the political structure, social patterns, and as well as religious understandings. And in order for you to prove that modernity is progressive, you have to posit and support a very regressive religious construct. And therefore, the most regressive part of the religious establishment was actually popped up as a way to show that the way for you to be moving the word modernity progressive, unless you want to go back to the cave. That's basically the argument, right? So that was a colonial structure inherited by our elites, where our elites were trained. And most of our elites were trained by in the colonial motherlands to come back and implement an imitative project that actually tells you that you're incapable. So structurally, each one of the post-colonial state and the political structure in, the, in there is actually looking at themselves saying, I am incapable and I need somebody from the global north to tell me how. So it's actually structurally infantile economy, infantile political processes, infantile social processes. And that requires an intellectual project for us to do it. Meaning the critique I'm having is that an increase in piety 
does not necessarily translate to ending the colonial project. It requires a complete transformation intellectually, politically, socially, economically, and then you have piety in order for you to actually accomplish that task. So it's a very complex process. Unfortunately, this is my last part of it, the first word in the Quran is Zikra, we stopped reading as Muslims. Right? We're the CD, right? MP3 community. And we have transformed our tradition into a form of religious entertainment. Just bring me an entertainer that gives me subhanAllah, mashallah, a few times, and a few zingers of a hadith and ayahs, and therefore I'm sitting in there in basically like in, in a trance. Our tradition is not about, again, I'm not speaking about spiritual attainment, our tradition requires for us serious understandings. And that's why had there been any other word in the Quran more valuable than Iqra, it would have started with that. It's a command, Iqra. Okay, so that's what is required. No civilization can be uplifted without reading, education, and taking it to the highest level in terms of educational attainment. And I'm not talking about here again. I love MDs and engineers, but we have too many of them. Right? I have so many students at Berkeley. All of them are, you know, MCB, 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 X, 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 MCB, 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 MCB. And then all of a sudden I say, oh, somebody's studying something different. Out of 800 students, is still 90 to 98 percent are studying MD and engineer because they want to get married. So the parents are on much part of the issue, like anyone else, too. So, that's my answer. Yeah, you answered my question, reading and building the intellect. That is... And econ economy, sustainable economy, cooperative economy, building, you know, enterprises. Last question. <laughs> So, uh, I have two questions. First one is about, uh, I can say that this one is modern colonialism that's happened in Transnistrian because it's uh, more than, I can say more than 60 years. It's 70 years. 70 years, something like that. So, and if you add the bulk, it's 100 years. Yeah, but if we see the condition of people in Palestine, they still look like strong and then against the Zionism. So my question is, what's the reason, what's the uh, 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 the factor that the people in Palestine still stand up like uh, today? The second one is about, I know about the PLO, they have also like uh, the Intifada movement and then uh, become Hamas. What's, uh, what's the contribution for this organization to uh, Palestinian people? Yeah. Well, why the Palestinians are still, still resisting? Because they're still under occupation. So that just, uh, uh, there is an aspect of what you call the conditions produces a response to what is present in there. The other part is that because we're under occupation, actually, to some level, it created or incentivized creating cohesion in the community and maintaining the bonds of lineage in the society. Uh, because the ability or the uh, breakdown that might have been experienced by outside of Palestine was mitigated as a result of the confinement that are there. So they had to actually find ingenious ways to connect and network with each other, and that contributed into some level of cohesion and stability in there. Uh, and that translates over, uh, you know, from almost the last 50 years or so. Now, as far as the political landscape of Palestinians, we are right now at the lowest level of our political uh, body politics is at the lowest level. We're fragmented, uh, and I would again say as a consequence of an intensification of the occupation and intensification of the colonial project that resulted in this fragmentation. So it's not incidental, but rather uh, part and parcel. Uh, that fragmentation 
has consequences and that's in that it makes it possible for a more accelerated Israeli success in various parts of uh, land confiscation, uh, uh, misallocations of uh, water resources, disrupting our political uh, program on the international level with the International Court of Justice, where the Palestinian Authority ended up withdrawing the Goldstone Report that would have been a very important step to get the International Court of Justice as well as the European Union to uh, carry on investigation. Also, uh, considerable, uh, our fragmentation led to considerable uh, disruption of the United Nations process, even though the last resolution, uh, the Palestinians essentially were um, uh, going back and forth uh, on supporting the resolution against the settlements that came out from the Security Council. So the contribution at this point is, I would say, is in a very precarious position because it's fragmented. And the division is real, and that division is projecting itself internally as well as uh, uh, globally. Uh, and I'm a one that calls for an attempt to reconfigure the Palestinian body politic in order to begin to address uh, some of those weaknesses. Okay, I'll, last question yeah, for sure. Otherwise, I'll begin charging for questions. <laughs> okay, sorry, last question. Thank you so much. Um, recently, Pope Francis called for uh, the international community to recognize Palestine as an official state. Do you see this as just a public gesture of goodwill and to increase his, you know, look, um, or as a, do you see a political motive here? What, is, what, what, what political interest does the Catholic Church have in the state of Palestine? No, again, I wrote an article when uh, Pope Francis uh, called uh, for this recognition and the Catholic Church itself uh, recognizing uh, state of Palestine. These are important symbolic steps. It represents a shift in uh, global public opinion that the Pope, in essence, is representing that shift in public opinion. Uh, the biggest impediment in this is the United States. Uh, Latin America, for the most part, uh, is uh, heavily supportive of Palestine and Palestinian rights. At the UN, whenever we get a major resolution at the General Assembly, we only get about four to five votes against. That you get the United States, you get Israel, the Marshall Island, Micronesia, right? Those are the countries that oppose Palestinian rights. But then when you get to the Security Council, then it becomes a tough because you have the veto power and the United States have used the veto power to protect and prevent Palestinian rights from being expressed almost 72 different times. So the Pope expression is very important as part of symbolic shift in public opinion. Even in the United States, the most recent polling among the millennials, there's been a shift in public opinion that they're more pro-Palestinian or side with the Palestinians than Israel. So you're actually also seeing that shift among the millennials in the United States, even with the massive amount of expenditures that APAC is spending and all the top political figures that are promoting Israel, even with that, they're unable to sustain a maintenance of the public opinion in the U.S. And I think the Democratic Party is moving and shifting in this, and I think the Pope's message is very important that we need to utilize in educating and speaking to people about Palestine. Thank you.